I want to first thank each one of you who got the message to pray for the wife. She's been very, very sick. We didn't know what it was and don't know what taken place. It's just a severe vomiting. She's practically unconscious and fever about 105 and had to keep her wrapped in ice blankets. So, um, But she's all right now. The fever's all gone and she's okay. So she's awfully weak, lost by 10 pounds, I suppose. She hasn't, tonight she swallowed her first bite since Sunday. And so she's been very sick, and we trusted the Lord for her, and He has brought her through. Amen. Now we want to tell you to continue to pray. She'll gain her strength back. And now this coming weekend, the Lord willing, I've got to go to Miami. My old friend, Brother Bosworth, is uh, going home. And he's nearly 100 years old now. And he called me and said, Brother Bram, come see me right at once. I want to tell you something before I go. And he, well, I think he wants to pray for me and just lay his hands on me before he leaves, you know. And I, I hope that I can end my days Amen. with a reputation like F.F. F. Bondsworth. Of all the men I know in the world, every man I've ever met in the world, I've never met a man that I was so desirous to be like, like F.F. F. Bondsworth, as, as a minister, what I mean. I have never heard one person worldwide, anywhere, ever make one statement about F.F. F. Bosper, but what was just exactly uh, everything Christian and everything a real brother. Partings leave behind his footprints on the sands of time. He's a wonderful brother, and he's real old now, near 100, so he's, he's just going home, that's all. And he told me he knew he was going and was uh, just waiting. He said the sweetest time of his life's right now, when he's just waiting, but said he'd know that he was going out. said... I'm supposed to go to Michigan this week, Brother Bosworth. And uh, he said, well, don't make it too long, Brother Branham. I can't last much longer. I'm getting weaker all the time. So he's been too much of a friend to me not to go down. Now, if I have to fly down, I'll, I'll fly back and maybe be back for, uh, at least for Sunday night. If not, well, then I'll have to drive and it may take me a little longer. And pray for Brother Bosworth. Just pray that God, and when he takes the old patriarch, he'll just... Send a chair to fire and pick him up. See, him. I love him. He's been like a daddy to me. Another old man, him and Brother Seward. I, I, kind of partial to old people. I, I love him. Old Brother Seward. He went to sleep like that too. Of course, Brother Seward wasn't quite as old. I don't think as Brother Bosworth. And uh, pray for Brother Bosworth. Everything's not roses around the place, but it's it's. Uh, he needs your prayers, but not so much for nothing, but just his. God will let him go in peace. Now, and then we want to remember also that tomorrow, the Lord willing, we bury one of our friends from this church, Brother Saul uh, Coates. He's been here several times. Worked at the post office for years. And he died over to Veterans Hospital the other night. Brother Cox and I went over to see him and he had pretty low. And he's gone on now, a Christian. And we're to bury him from Coots' funeral at home. Tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock, Brother Neville and I. Neville Trio will be singing and we'll be dividing up the services, Brother Neville and I. That is, I didn't know when we made the arrangements, just what, and on account of meeting. And so then uh, his funeral will be tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock at Coots Funeral Home. And then at 2 o'clock Friday, uh, Mr. Wheeler, we called him Pod Wheeler. He's, uh, I forget really what he's writing. No, I, I seen it in the paper and didn't know who it was until I found out. He was a neighbor of ours for years, and, and he's just passed away. He's right here in front of the church the other night. I was trying to get him to come in church the other night. About three weeks ago, stood right there, and I just trying to persuade him to come in church because I don't think he went to church or had any profession of any kind. Yet he's got a boy that's a Baptist preacher. But uh, he didn't have any profession as far as I know of, and he's uh, gone on now to meet God. So that'll be... Uh, Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock at uh, Coots' funeral home and also Brother Neville and I'll be singing in that, that funeral there. And uh, so uh, if any of you wants to, uh, to attend the services, uh, that's tomorrow at 2, or tomorrow at 1, I think that's right, isn't it, Brother? And 2 of the other one, is that right? 2 at the Coots' funeral home. And now Sunday morning, Saturday will be the broadcast, and Brother Neville will probably let you know then just what if we can have a healing service for Sunday night, or what time we'll be back if we fly down to to Florida to see Brother Biles. Brother, don't know just how I get away from him. He's such a dear old friend, and probably our last times to meet, if Lord permits it, on this earth. 
And he, I don't know if I can get away from him right away or not. And uh, I don't want to get away from him, but you know how it is. You got other things got to do. Now there's one statement I'd like to say here. While there are not too many and people who's my friends, I'm glad to see Sister Smith there. The first time I've seen her in a long time. How are you, Sister Smith? A year. My, I believe last time I seen you. At Benton Harbor. Hope to get up there sometime. That's fine. I believe the last time I've seen you is at a funeral service in Louisville. And uh, I remember Sister Smith very well. How we, I used to come get her in a truck when we go down to church. <laughs> Old cold tar hanging out the back up and the fenders flopping up and down. It cold. Me one foot sitting on the outside. Oh, my. A lot of water's passed down the river since then, Sister Smith. Yes, sir. Well... We thank the Lord for those precious memories and still love Him. Uh, one thing someone might wonder the other night, I was talking to Brother Fleeman out on the street. And sometimes someone said, as soon as service is over, what makes Brother Branham is take right off and go? Here's what it is. My wife's alone. See? And if I get to talking, I'll talk half the night. And there she is sitting up there by herself most of the time. And that's the reason I... Hurry out to get back to her, you see, uh, of a night time. Because I get to talking, I talk too long. I'll talk to this in a half hour. I just can't go by and say, how are you tonight? How are you? How are you? I don't do that. I just stop and go talking. Somebody go talk about something, and then I'm there for an hour, see. And that's why she sets up and waits and so forth. And that's why it is. I just didn't want you to think it was because I didn't want to meet my friends and shake their hands and express our fellowship and so forth. But it was just a case of that kind. So now... Everyone be in prayer for the sick and afflicted. And Mrs. Harvey is in all that trouble. She's getting all right. Yes, sir. And I don't see... I, now, there may be, as far as I know, someone, a doctor here. And if I'm wrong over this platform, God forgive me. But I believe God will hold them doctors responsible for what they've done to the woman. Uh, I believe in surgery. I believe in uh, medicine. Certainly, I believe it. I think God sent him here to help us. Just lame to send mechanics for cars and so forth. But that little woman, the doctor laid her back and said she's full of cancer. There's nothing could be done. A little mother of a bunch of children. I went down to her and tried to explain to her how that uh, through prayer, and, and she's just a young woman, about 25, and uh, how that God healed her little baby. It's called the Miracle Baby or Children's Hospital now of meningitis. And it was such a horrible condition of the, uh, the little fellow was, and the Lord healed it just right away. And they, the doctors couldn't understand it. I went out to Mrs. Harvey, and I said, Miss Harvey, the doctors give you up. Yes, sir. His, and the husband said, yes, there's nothing can be done. She's just completely filled with cancer. I said, well, now what we want to do is to believe God, that God will, will heal, uh, heal you. And I said, how it happens, the cancer might not leave immediately, but if we pray, then the life of the cancer leaves. You may be sick quite a while yet, and and I said, you may get a relief right away. And I said, then after a few days, you may get sicker than ever. But I said, you've got to put your faith against the cancer. I said, if the cancer lives, you die. If the cancer dies, you live. And I said, now we'll pray. And we prayed. And with every evidence that I've seen, God touched the woman's body. And immediately, she got better. She went over to see my mother. She visited around the neighborhood when she just was in such misery and didn't have no pains. And then after about three days, she started getting sick again. And then come to find out that the city said that they would pay the doctor bill if the doctors had operated. And I, if I'm wrong, God forgive me, but they took that young mother made a guinea pig out of her. They took her out there and took even her bowels from her stomach and everything. Took both from the urinal and from the bowel action and poked them out the sides and was on an operating table nine hours and something the nurse that looked like a slaughter pen where to throw her insides from place to place and put plastic ovaries and plastic tubes. That's plain, but that's true. And plastic bowels and things like that and left the woman laying and that fixed a little mother. I say in my way of thinking it, them doctors is guilty of murder. She told him, she said, Brother Brandon prayed for me and said, we're going to believe that our cancer's, that the cancer's dead. Said, I got some news for you. Your cancer's alive. How could he tell it? It's on the inside. No x-ray can tell it. Cancer's a, you can't tell cancer for x-ray. It's flesh itself. Amen. You can't see it. The only one thing is chopped into the woman and cut her to pieces. 
That's all. Uh, if they'd been a little mother, I'd just let her test her faith against God instead of making a guinea pig out of somebody like that. Now, if, I, if I'm wrong, if, I, if I've got the wrong motive, I want God to forgive me, you see. Because I don't want you thinking I don't believe in operations or don't believe in doctors and things. That's all right. But I think you ought to know what you're doing before you dig into a person, not use them just for experiment like that. That's right. And now, of course, she can't live. That's all. If she lives, it'll certainly be one of the greatest miracles that's ever happened. When the woman looked down and seen that her bowels on one side and her kidneys had to act on the other side, she just passed away like this past. Well, it wasn't a thing. A poor little thing was gone. And just about a 22 or 25-year-old mother with three or four little kitties to raise. Most pitiful thing I ever heard in my life. I said, to my way of thinking that the doctor's guilty for, if he'd taken that woman just for an experiment because the city was going to pay for it, then that's wrong. Shouldn't be. Well, I tell you, brother, if it's not impossible, and it's it's not it's uh, it's possible and also probable because I know a man that had an arm off in California. You all are keeping up with it yourself in the paper. Was prayed for, and this arm is off up here. It's done grow down to the fingers. Is coming out on it now, through the elbow, through the wrist, through the hand, and parts of the knuckles is back on the fingers. You see, it's in the I believe the Herald of Faith each month when he's got his hands out like this, shoulder on where his arm is off, where it's grown out. Each month, how it's come for about a year. Sure, that's right. I believe it's a rare thing. See, it's a very rare thing. Uh, once in a while, I've heard of it. Now, with Brother Bosworth, he prayed for a woman one night, and I had one in my meeting. But Brother Bosworth was instantly mind taking a quite a little bit for it to do it. He prayed for a woman, I read the woman's testimony, had cancer with no nose, it eat her nose off, and the next morning the woman had a nose. Yeah. Now, I know this, now that's Brother Bosworth in his book called uh, The Christ the Healer, I believe, or The Joy Bringer One. Now, it's in the testimony of the woman with her name and address, and she's got neighbors and doctors and everything else to prove it. It happened. Now, at Little Rock, Arkansas, one night in a room... I prayed there, not Little Rock, but Jonesboro, that I'd pray. I said, I'm going to stay till I pray for the last person. I was eight days and nights in the platform, see. And then, and w along the room, there's a woman coming, I had her handkerchief up like this, and I thought she was weeping. And I said, well, I guess it's two or three o'clock in the morning. I said, don't weep, sister. God's a healer. She said, I'm not weeping, Brother Bram. She moved it. She had no nose. See, the doctors had said the cancer done eat down to the white bone in her, it was, it was showing. And I had prayer for her and asked the Lord to heal her. And about four or five weeks of man, I was in Texarkana. And there was a nice dressed gentleman sitting there. He said, uh, could I have just a word, Brother Bram, as soon as he got to the platform? One of the ushers tried to make him keep quiet. I said, well, let's see. He said, you recognize this young lady? I said, no, I don't. She said, if you look at this picture, you'd recognize it. And he was an exterminator at at uh, Texarkana, and that was his mother with a brand new nose growed on, just shaped just like the other. <laughs> now, that goes to show that God, I have seen it done. Now, God could do that for the little Mrs. Harvey, and I pray that he does, for the poor little thing wants to live. Brother Tony, did you have something? Well, Bill, I want to encourage this young man. I like to get killed one night and disobedience to God. Yeah, from the trailer cut right 
street and a half, dropped me right down about three blocks. My sister lost house where this person had been in the hospital there in Chattanooga. Well, we went up to see him. We prayed for the man. And God wonderfully restored where that man had no stomach, no bowels, and nothing down that front bill. And that God restored that man completely whole from him. Yeah. Now that's nothing at all. And sure. Amen. Amen. Yep, that's good too. Yes, he'll sure do it. He's a healer. Yes. Yes. Yes, brother. Sure. Yeah. I'd sure like hope that God restores it to his son, you can take it right back and show him. That's just Amen. exactly. It's for a testimony to the glory of God. Amen. Pray that God will do it. Amen. Oh, he, he, if he's almighty God, he can do all things. Amen. If he can't do all things, he's not almighty God. Amen. There's something that made us what we are in the way that we are, or we would have had a, a head like a bird or something like that. If there wasn't a master mind behind us to make each one of us was a feature, to make an oak tree, a poplar tree, a palm tree, and, and differentiate between them what, what they are, make us... Not with uh, some with fur and some with feathers and some with skins. Uh, see, it's it's a master mind behind that. It's a it's a governor. That of course he holds all things in his hands, and I know he can do all things. And we'll pray for it. We'll pray. Amen. <laughs> right. We got. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, that's all right. Great. But I know he's a prayer answering God, and I know he's still healed. Amen. Amen. Because my hip was giving me so much trouble, I couldn't hardly sit down. It just sing, you know, it wasn't pain, but it's sound. That rolls on my hip, and you pray for me the other Sunday. Thank God it's gradually getting away. I don't even feel it anymore. Amen. 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 You know, I tried to thank Sister Snyder one time. When I was standing here in that anointing, I thought I told Brother Cox, I said, I'm not even going to try any more of those discernment meetings at Tabernacle. Oh, you don't know how the devil bites me around the stump, sister. Uh, how, how he does it, uh, you know, uh, tell me about these discerning. And here, happened to find out that Miss Woods' sister here, I'd never seen any of their people. A bunch of them was healed during that time. And everyone, well, you know, it's a great percent of those people that was healed. And... After the, uh, the strange thing, I, her sister, I had eaten supper with her one night about two weeks before that. Oh, it's way down in the mountains in Kentucky. And I, I just know she had a voice like Miss Woods and it wasn't too light at the room. And I never paid any attention to her anyhow. I talked more to her husband. She got separated. We went out and sat down and eat and come back in. I talked to her husband, got up and went on out. And God, who's my solemn judge, knows that but this pulpit, I never recognized that woman. And then, after the healing service is over, I made the altar call for sinners to repent, and she had been very arrogant against it. And she repented and gave her life to Christ. Man. Raised up her hand, and she would surrender her life to Christ, and was weeping. After all the anointing had done gone, making an altar call, and so forth. And then, I happened to turn, and here was a vision, and I seen her brother, which was a sister 
This was his sister. And them together, and I thought it was Charlie's wife because I knew sitting at the table the other day down there at, at Charlie's house, his little wife, little bitty thing, the Lord showed me a trouble that she had had. And from that very hour, the Lord touched her body sitting there at her table now. Tony, where we were at down there, went squirrel hunting. And the Lord touched her body and took this thing she had to wear all of for the rest of her life away from her. Just sitting there, and the little woman always eat way up to the other end of the table, but today she comes right around and moves her chair in and eats right beside of me. She never knew what she was doing. Her husband sitting like this, and Brother Banks sitting there and us talking, and she moved around and got her chair and sat over here by my side, and it was for a purpose. The Lord showed a vision right there, and I called her husband out because it was a lady's trouble. I began to tell him about what happened. He said, Brother Ram, that's exactly the way it happened, exactly. Like that, and there he told her, and the Lord healed her. All right? And then after the service is over, the other night, and this other sister, I seen this young Charles and this woman together. I thought that must be his wife, but his wife's a blonde and this is a black-headed woman. And I happened to notice the vision moved over in a corner over here. And she was sitting there wiping her eyes, and the Lord showed a vision after she was, the altar call, after the prayer meeting was over, the healing of the sick, and the altar call had been made, and God waited till she repented and gave her life to Him and then turned around and healed her. And she's had her troubles, had her swelled up for years. And she's went down so much and everything till even her feet's wrinkled. Where all the fats from her, the poisons from her body. Feels better than she's ever felt in years, see. And how the Lord by His amazing grace does that. I think that's about the story his sister was. And how He does. After, what's say? Seven pounds in a week. Oh, He's God, isn't He? Now, i tell you a reason I said to Brother Neville, I thought maybe he had a message for tonight. He said, no, he didn't. And I've got a few questions here that was left over. I felt morally obligated to get down here and answer these questions. Then I've got two or three more. I probably won't get tonight. I want to show you something just handed in from a preacher. Brother Neville just, or Beeler just brought them to me. What do the stones represent in Revelation 21, 19, and 20? Explain the four beasts of Revelation 5. He means six. But it is in Revelation 5, it's 6, I think. And um, who are the 24 elders? What did the scarlet thread of Genesis 38 mean? Where are the gifts to be sent regarding the death of the two witnesses, Revelation 11? Where will be the saints after the thousand years reign, and what kind of a body will they have? How shall we judge angels... What hair becomes of the angels of 1 Corinthians? Talk about some good ones. That's some good ones. I probably won't get to them tonight, but if the Lord willing, I'll try to get them the next time we come in. So that I've got some pretty good ones in here tonight. So we'll just pray now and ask the Lord to help us. We go right into them for the next all oh, 35, 40 minutes. Now, blessed Heavenly Father, we are grateful to Thee for all that Thou hast done for us no, oh, it's so amazing how that your grace reaches Amen. down to us. Amen. I'm thinking now the other night, and that little companion of mine, oh, so sick, and you come on the scene. Amen. Her fever began to break from that very hour, and it's got completely over now. I thank you. And uh, the, just pray that you'll be with each and every one that's asked to request tonight. And little do we know till it comes to our own home what it means, a little prayer. Amen. Oh, God, what, how, how real you become. Yes. And that hour when a doctor will walk away and say, I don't know, I've never seen anything act like it. And then the Lord Jesus move in on the scene. Oh, God, you're so real to us and we're so happy for it. We pray you forgive us of all of our slowful ways and our stupid ways and Oh, just remember us, Lord, that we're human flesh in a dark world, a world of darkness and sin and chaos. And we're looking through a veil as it was over our face. And we only see and know as we do humanly here, but someday when that veil's lifted, we'll see you face to face and know as we're known. That's the day that we long for. We pray, Father, now that you'll help us as we try to impart to the people the Word of God according to their request. Take all sickness from us. We need you, Lord. And we pray that you'll grant it. Let thy mercies be given to us. 
For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in answering questions, I'm not the best in the country, you know, but I'm just answering the best of my knowledge. Here was the one that I started with the other night, and I had to stop. By one Spirit, we are all baptized into the body of Christ. You all remember that that was the question I was on. Now, that's found, of course, in 1 Corinthians 12. At the time we are received the new birth, this takes place. It's this, is this the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Or is there a later baptism? Or is it a filling? Now, there is quite a question, and we could spend the rest of our time right on that one, and the night and tomorrow night and so forth. It would cover, it would, it would take and tie the entire Bible together. Every scripture must properly tie together with every other scripture in the Bible. But just trying to make it just a briefly, plain as I know how to make it. No, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you then have the new birth. When you believe on the Lord, you receive a new thought, a new life. But it isn't the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. See? You've got the new birth when you believe. You've got eternal life. It's a gift of God that's given to you through sovereign grace by accepting the gift that God is giving to you. He, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath eternal life, has everlasting life. That's the new birth. You're converted. It means you're turned around. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit puts you into the body of Christ subject to the gifts for service. It doesn't make you any more of a Christian. It just puts you into the body of gifts. See? Now, by one Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, we're all baptized into one body. Now, says Paul, there are different uh, uh, gifts. And in this body is nine spiritual gifts. And in this body, you have to be baptized into the body to possess one of these gifts. They come with the body. But now, as far as having eternal life and being a Christian, you are a Christian the moment you believe. Now, that's not make-believe. That's truly believe on the Lord Jesus and accept Him as your personal Savior. You are born again right there and have eternal life. God comes into you. Now, watch. Eternal life. Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath eternal life Amen. and shall not come into the judgment but pass from death unto life. Amen. You're a new creature right then. Then Paul had met some of those people up in Acts 19. They had a preacher up there which was a converted lawyer by the name of Apollos. And Apollos was a mighty man in the Scriptures. And he was proven by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. See? Now watch. Apollos, through the Word, was proving by the Word, faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. He that heareth my Word and believeth on Him that sent me has everlasting life. Amen. Get it? Yes. Apollos, yes. by the Word, was proven, and these were Christians, they were followers disciples. And Apollos was proving by the word that Jesus was the Christ and they had great joy and received the word, yet knowing only the baptism of John. And when Paul passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, he finds these disciples and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? Amen. See? Now when you believe, Jesus said you have eternal life. That's a new birth. That's your conversion. Change but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the power of God that you're baptized into and a subject to these nine spiritual gifts to work through you, such as preaching, evangelists, apostles, pastors, prophets, and all the gifts of the body. Come into this when you're baptized into this body. And that doesn't make you any more Christian. It just sets you positionally in a place to be a ministering spirit in the church of the living God. Now, you get it? See? 
Now, the question is, let's answer just one by one these three questions. By one Spirit, we are all baptized into the body of Christ. That's correct. 1 Corinthians 12 would give the answer to that. All right. At that time, we received the new birth. This takes place. Is that one? That's what they want to know. Yes. No, uh, by one Spirit, no. No. By one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body. See? That isn't when the new birth begins. The new birth begins when you believe on the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, see, there's not, a, there's not one thing. Now, listen. What can you do besides believe? What more can you do? What can you do about it any more than just believe it? Amen. Tell me one thing you could do. There's not one thing that you can do outside of believing. Now, if anything comes outside of your believing, it is an act of your own. It's an act of God. Therefore, I would say that when you, a lot of times I've seen many times people accepting the initial evidence of speaking in tongues as the Holy Ghost. And sometimes shake the people or beat them and pat them and say it, say it, say it, say it. You know, uh, repeat a word over and over, say it, say it, say it. See, it's something you're doing yourself. And, and, and it don't, it doesn't, it, it's nothing. You might get a confusion of tongues. You might get uh, a lot of things and sensations. But if anything comes outside of your own personal faith, it has to be a divine gift of God given to you. See? And by one spirit... We are all baptized into one body. That's correct, see? The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a different act from the new birth. Amen. One is a birth. One is a baptism. Amen. One brings you eternal life. The other gives you power. Amen. It gives power in the eternal life, Amen. see, to operate. Amen. I got it? Amen. Okay. All right. Now, here is a, another. Come second. The best that I had them at that night. Where was Jesus' spirit the three days his body was in the tomb? Where was his spirit? Now, his spirit, if you follow the scriptures, well, we could just bring many places, but I want, who's got a Bible? Brother Stricker, you got a Bible? All right, Brother Neville, you got one? Get me Psalms 16.10. And uh, who else? Sister Woods, you got a Bible there? Well, uh, Brother Stricker, all right, either one. You get me Acts 2.27. Acts 2.27. Now, the first place, when Jesus died, when you die, your body dies. The word death means to separate. Just to be separated from your loved ones. But here he said this in St. John, the 11th chapter. He that heareth not... I beg your pardon. That's in St. John 5, 24. He that heareth my words has eternal life. Jesus said to Martha, who come to meet him, she said, If thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now whatsoever you ask God, or God will give it to you. He said, I am the resurrection and life. See? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. Now, now, there's a part of us that does not die. And as I've just come through the line of scriptures, everything that has a beginning has an end. It's the things which has not a beginning that has no end. Therefore, when we accept Christ, God, we become sons and daughters of God, and our life is just as endless as God's life is endless. Amen. We have eternal life. Now, the word forever, we've been through it. The word forever is a space of time. Forever and conjunction forever. And we found out here that it has, it has an end. Just like all the sufferings and all the sickness and all the sorrow and all the punishment and hell itself has an end. But eternal life has no end because it had no beginning. It never can die because it never was born. It had no beginning of days. It has no ending of time. Now, the only way that we can live eternally is through receiving something that is eternal. And God was before there was anything. It was God. God never had a beginning or an end. And God was this great spirit. We pictured him like a, the, the seven colors of the rainbow. 
It covers, the bow would actually cover the earth if it didn't strike the earth. It's just the water in a circle of the curvature of the earth what makes it. But now, as God is eternal and He was perfect, perfect love, perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect satisfaction, all those seven spirits as we get in Revelation that come out was made up, God, was perfection. Everything else outside of that has been something that's been perverted from that. Now, the only way that we can come back to perfection is to come back with that perfection, which is God. Then we come to perfection, then we have eternal life without end or without, without anything. It's just forever. Eternal life. Now he's speaking of the soul, the spirit. For we pack our bodies over the grave of the saintest of us for this body. And the body in the first place when God, the Logos, that went out of God, or as I have went through it, the Catholic call it the eternal sonship of God, which, as I have said before, the word doesn't even make sense. See, they cannot be an eternal son. Because the Son had to have a beginning. And so Jesus had a beginning. God had no beginning. See? But the Son was the uh, eternal Sonship. But the Son that was with the Father in the beginning was the Logos that went out of God. And it was the theostomy of God that went out the human form that didn't have eyes like you see, a better eye. It didn't have ears like you hear, but a far more hearing. See, it was a theostomy that all this rainbow condescended into a, a theostomy. Moses saw it when it passed through the rock like that. He saw the back parts that looked like a man. Abraham saw him when he stepped down into human flesh and eat a calf, drink some milk, eat the butter. Abraham saw him as he just stepped in and vanished right away from it. We found out that our bodies are made of 16 elements of the earth. They just come together and God pulled them together and put two angels in these bodies. Angels that stood and talked and angels were man at, one, at that time. Now, notice, we find out that who was Melchizedek? But God himself. It couldn't have been no one else. For he was the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. He had no father or mother. Couldn't have been Jesus because he had father and mother. He had no beginning of days, no ending of life. There's only one that has that. That's God. It was God dwelling here in a theostomy. See? Notice. King of Salem. Now, God has lived through the age to His people. It was God that was in David that made Him set upon the mountain as a rejected king and weep. That same Spirit was manifested in Jesus, the son of David, who was rejected in Jerusalem and wept. Joseph sold for 30 pieces of silver, hated of his brother, loved of his father, received the right hand of Pharaoh, and no man could come except and never come by Joseph, and the trumpet sounded, never knee bowed to Joseph. Perfect type of Christ. That was the spirit of Christ living through those men. See? Now, now here, when Jesus died, it was God manifested in flesh. God became man. In the laws of redemption, the only way that a man could redeem the lost the state of Israel, he had to be a kinsman. He had to be a close kinsman. The book of Ruth beautifully explains it. And he had to be a kinsman, so God had become kinfolks to man. In order that man could become kinfolks to God. Amen. See, he has a spirit in him, a man does when he's born, because it's a spirit of nature. It's a spirit of the world. It's a spirit of the... The God of this world. He is merely an offspring of Adam. A tree reproduces itself. A vegetation reproduces itself. Animals reproduce themselves. Humans reproduce themselves. They are the byproduct of original creation. Get it? Now, now when a man is born, he's born with a spirit in him of this world. That's the reason he has to be born again. For this spirit come from the uh, conception by a father and mother, which was a sexual conception and absolutely could not live forever. So he's got to be born again. 
And before he could do that, God had to come down and make a way for him to be born again because he had no way to redeem himself. He was without hope. He didn't, he's out hope without God, without Christ in the world, lost and gone. He, 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 there's nothing he could do to save himself. He, every, no matter if he was a high priest, if he was a bishop, if he was a pope, whatever he was, he's just as guilty as the next man. So it had to take one that was not guilty to do it. And the only one that wasn't guilty was God himself. Man. And God had to come down and become man, and he came in the form of Christ to anchor the stinger of death, to take the sting of death out to redeem us, that we, not by our works or by our goodness, we have none, but by His grace to be saved. Amen. Then we receive of His life into this mortal body, and now we are sons and daughters of God and have eternal life within us. Amen. We are sons and daughters of God. Therefore, Jesus, being alive, and no man, no matter how wicked or how good, when He has to... When he leaves this earth, he's not dead. Amen. He's somewhere else. But he has a life that will perish after he's punished in hell for his deeds. He, but yet that life has to cease. There's only one type of eternal life. Now, we've been through that. If a man can be a sinner and be punished forever, he can't be punished forever unless he's got eternal life. If he's got eternal life, he's saved. Amen. See? So there's only one type of eternal life, and that's the Zoe, the life of God. And he can't perish. But the wicked are in a place of, of waiting and torment for their judgment to be judged according to the deeds done in the body at the last day. Now, but we, some men, sins go before them, some follow after them. Now, if we confess our sins, he's just to forgive us, Therefore, we'll never have to stand the judgment of God. You get it? Look, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, that are in Christ, that's passed from death and life. See, we have no condemnation that is in Christ Jesus, that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, he that heareth my words, believes on him, and he has eternal life. And if I've been accepted in Christ and Christ took my judgments and I accepted His propitiation for my sins, how can God judge me? He's done judge me when He judged Christ. Then I'm free from judgment. Then when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. See? But now the wicked is not so. He goes into a place of torment. And we know that that's true. The wicked is alive. He's in a place of torment. He's in a place where he don't know. That's how these spirits of some mediums call up these spirits of the people that's gone on. Some kind of frolic and dirty jokes and things that crack, if you've ever seen any of it. All right. Wow, they don't... Look at this Miss Pepper before my article went of the miracle of Donnie Martin. How many read that article? There's many of you did, sure. And it's in uh, Reader's Digest. Did you notice just before that went forth Miss Pepper? The greatest spiritualist the world has ever known. Twelve pages given to her story. And for 50 years, they've had her over the world and scientific proof and everything that she absolutely talks with the dead. And the people come up. What? God's name wasn't mentioned one time. No repentance, no divine healing, nothing about it. See, only thing it was was those people mentioned, John, don't you know me? I'm George. It was at a certain place and I did so and so and so and so. Remember that place we went and done this? See, that's all they know. They're gone, passed from. There's they're nothing left but judgment. The way the tree leans, that's the way it falls. In the state you die, that's the reason I differ from praying for the dead. See? The intercession of prayers or, con or a communion of saints and so forth. It cannot be according to God's Word. It does no good to pray for anybody after they're gone. They're finished. They're, uh, they've, they've passed the line between mercy and judgment. They either went to mercy or went away from mercy. Jesus said so. In 16th chapter of St. Matthew. He, he, he taught a 16th chapter of Mark, I believe it is, the rich man and Lazarus. No man could cross over this gulf and never will cross over. There you are, see? So it settles it. Now, but when Christ died, everything had to witness that he was the Christ. Now, let's go to your question. The first thing, the stars refused to shine. The sun went down. The moon wouldn't give its light. The earth belched its rocks at his death. And he 
went and preached to the souls that were in prison, that repented not in the long suffering of the days of Noah. He, they had to recognize. Look at that. In a fair by chance, be a sinner here tonight. Think that over a minute. Someday, this gospel that you're hearing preached right now, you'll have to witness by. Somewhere, you bow your knee, regardless of who you are. It may be 10,000 years from today. It may not be until the, in the morning. Whatever it is, you're going to bow somewhere, and you're going to hear the same gospel preached right back to you. For after those souls were in prison that repented not when Enoch and when all of them preached to Noah and for the long suffering of God like it is now waiting for that time to come and Noah and Enoch and all of them preached and those people laughed and made fun of them. And they were in the prison house and Jesus went and preached to the souls that were in prison. He witnessed, the heavens witnessed he was. The earth witness he was. Amen. Hell witness he was. Amen. The Bible said that it, David, many years ago in the Psalms, all right, brother, you read the Psalms, if you will, there, uh, uh, Psalm 1610. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Read the same thing, brother, and uh, where Peter preached on Acts, uh, the second chapter, the 27th verse. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Read two verses above it, brother, so you can get the context, the context of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord, Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Read the next verse now. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy confidence. Yes. Notice. Now, my Jehovah Witness friend, I'd like to ask you about that. See? If hell is the place, Hades, Sheol, whatever you wish to call it, if that ceases at the grave, then why did he say, I will not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption? How about that? See? Here his body was in the grave and his soul was in hell preaching alive. What about that? He was in his theostomy again. His soul was down there with those people that were in theostomy also and was witnessing to them that they repented not in the long suffering. He would, in other words, he knocked at the door and when the door swung open and all those souls that repented, he said, I'm the seed of the woman. I'm the one that Enoch here over in paradise, another place. Don't never lose them three places now. The place of the wicked, the place of the righteous, and hell itself. See? Just like a trinity of heaven, like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, like the trinity of the beast, the false prophet, the beast, and the, and the mark of the beast, and all that. It remembers all in trinity. Trinity makes one. Perfected one is perfected. You're perfected one in three. Soul, body, and spirit. Water, blood, and nerves. See, whatever you are, you have to take three to make a perfected one. Amen. Take a three-cornered piece of glass and put the sun on you. you got a perfected rainbow. Amen. See, everything, you have to have three to make a perfect one. And now remember that when he died, he went first and preached to the souls that wasn't in prison that was in prison, and witnessed that he was the seed of the woman. He was the one that Enoch saw coming with ten thousands of his saints. He had to witness the scriptures that had been preached by Noah and by Enoch and by the righteous, that he was that one. Everything had to recognize it. Then he ascended into hell and received the keys of death and hell from the devil. Come back up into paradise and brought Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the righteous and raised Matthew 27 and they come out of the grave and enter into the city and appear to the people along the street. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. There you are. Now, but his body, while his soul was over here witnessing to the lost, 
down here taking the keys to the devil and coming back and bringing Abraham and Isaac, his soul was laying in the his soul was down there doing it, and his body was laying in the grave. Amen. That's the reason Jesus said. People say, "Well, why does Jesus say three days I'll raise it up? Three days I'll raise it. He died on Friday afternoon, raised up on Sunday morning. But watch, it was within three days if you get the lesson. Amen. For he knew that David, under the anointing of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, said, "I will not suffer my Holy One to see corruption." He knew that pertained to him. He knew that meant him. Amen. He was God's Holy One. And he knew that corruption sets in in 72 hours. Somewhere within them three days, he was coming out of there again. Because the scriptures cannot be broken. And every promise in there pertains to me and pertains to you. It's ours. He said, you destroy this body and I'll raise it up in three days. (laughs) For he said, I'll not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. He knew in three days that body was coming out of there. Amen. He didn't stay the full three days, no, sir. He certainly did not. He stayed just from Friday afternoon until Sunday morning. Not one cell of that body could be corrupted. Amen. And he was dead and embalmed and was laying, wrapped in cloth and laid into a tomb in that hot, boggy country. Just take a few hours and he'd go to corrupting. He'd go to mortifying, you know, his body, his nose dropping in and things. Corruption sets in. That hot, damp country. And it would have went to corrupting because it was a body. But he knew before that cell corrupted that God said through David, the prophet, I'll not suffer my Holy One to see corruption. Amen. How he took the Word of God and lived by it. Amen. Now, every one of them promises in there that pertain to him, God fulfilled every one of them, and every promise that pertains to the believer, God will fulfill every Amen. promise of it. Amen. Amen. Just rest assured Praise that it's the truth. Amen. So his soul, do you think it is... No, I'm sorry. Where was Jesus' spirit? Through the three days his body was in the tomb. His spirit was in hell. Down in the lower regions. And he arose. And I might add a little little statement here that might help you a whole lot. When he arose, his when he arose from the dead, he absolutely wasn't finished with the work of redemption yet. That's right. He had to clean the whole thing out. And the price had been paid, but the horror of hell, the horror of the grave. And here, when he when he died. He went right on. He never ceased working when he died. Amen. He kept on preaching. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Excuse my immodest acting, I guess. But he never ceased. Praise you Lord. never decease. Amen. Your body might rest for a while, but God will raise it up. He promised Amen. he would. But you can no more perish than God can perish. That's right. Look, his after he was dead, to what uh, dead to the disciples. He's asleep. What he was, they put him to sleep, like he said about Lazarus. I'll go wake him. God had to wake him. Look, he went right on down and continued preaching, and he preached to the souls here in prison. Went right on into hell. Got the keys of the devil. Come right back up and preached again in paradise, and rose back up again on the third day. Amen. Visit with his apostles for 40 days. And on the end of the 40th day, he went right on up because everything over the superstitions and everything else, he cut every superstition, every doubt, and made a prayer line from earth to glory in his ascension. Amen. Went up and sat down at the right hand of his majesty. Hallelujah. Overcomer, the great conqueror. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Death couldn't hold him. Hell couldn't hold him. Earth couldn't hold him. Amen. When he was here on earth, he was given the. He went to the lowest city and to the lowest people and was given the lowest name. That's what man done to him. He went to Jericho, the lowest city. The smallest man had to climb up in a tree to look down at him. Amen. That's where man put him. He was a foot wash flunky. The worst job that could be given. He become the lowest. He was called the lowest name that could be given. Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 
Man, give him the lowest name, the lowest place, and send him to the lowest regions of the lowest hell. Amen. God raised him up and sent him to the highest heavens. Amen. And a name above every name. Amen. Hallelujah. Why well, even has to look over to see heaven. Amen. Our throne is exalted above the heavens of heaven. Amen. And the greatest name that ever name in heaven and earth has to be it bounds around him. That's what God did to him. Man put him the lowest and God made him the highest. There was. From the lowest to the highest. He become the lowest that he might bring us up to the highest. He become us that we through his grace might become him. Sons of God. That's where he went. Amen. Blessing to him. He made a way that we can come to someday. Because I live, you live also. Oh, no wonder. When man catch that vision, there's never been a man could explain it. They've even tried to explain it, losing their mind. This great song, uh, Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how fabulous and strong. That last verse, I'll read the first verse it is. If we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies a parse that made, you know where that was found? Written on an insane wall in an insane institution. No man can never, ever explain that love of God. Oh, it can never be told Hallelujah. what he did for us. Glory. Ah, how could you place one merit out there? It's his grace from beginning to end. I was lost, undone, and helpless. No good, nothing about it. And he, by his grace, come and saved us. Oh, my. That's, his, that's my Lord. <laughs> that's his love. That's his goodness. Now we got about seven minutes and about 15 questions. But do you think it is right for women to do personal work outside the church? Yes. That's just a question, just a, not a scriptural question. But uh, certainly I do. Yes, sir. We're all workers together. Women have their places, and certainly they do. Yes, sir. Just do all the personal work you can do, and God will bless you for it. All right. Now let's see. Please explain the Trinity. How can the Son set at the right hand of the Father interceding for the, to the Father if they are not two persons? Well, beloved friend, that's a, that's, that's a revelation. <clears throat> if Jesus said, I am a Father one, then how can they be two? See? Now, they're not two. A woman once said to me, and I was explaining that, said, you and your wife are, are two, yet you're one. I said, but God and the Son is different from that. See, I said, you see me? Yes. Do you see my wife? No. I said, then Father and Son's different. Jesus said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. See? The Father and the Son, the Father was Almighty Jehovah God dwelling in a tabernacle called Jesus Christ, which was the anointed Son of God. Jesus was a man. God is a spirit. And no man has seen God at any time. But the only begotten of the Father has declared Him. He was, he, His personality, His being, His deity, whatever He was, He was God. He was nothing less or nothing more than God, yet He was a man. He was a man, a house that God dwelt in. That's right. He was God's dwelling place. Now, if you want some scriptures on that, Brother Neville, if you'd get me uh, St. Mark 14, um, 62, and uh, Sister Woods, you get me Ephesians 1, 20. Somebody else have a Bible? Oh, raise up your hand. Sister Arnold, you got one back there? All right, you get me Acts 7, 55. All right, Mark 14, 62, Brother Neville, and Sister Woods is Ephesians 1, 20, Acts 7, 55, uh, Sister Arnold. All right. Do you have it, Brother Neville? All right, read now. And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. All right. Now, what's the first phrase there? Jesus said, I am. I am. Who was the I am? There has never been a man in all the world could interpret it. Even the, you who read the lexins and so forth. There has never been a man who could make out his J-B-H-U. And even the Hebrew scholars could never pronounce it. That burning bush there that day 
when he met with Moses. It was J-V-H-U, so they pronounced it J-O-H, Jehovah. But it isn't Jehovah. J-V-H-U. See? No one knows. And he said, well, Moses couldn't make it out. He said, who can I say? He said, say, I am sent you. I am. Now what? I am is a present tense. Not I was or I will be. I am. Now, he said, this will be a memorial through all generations. I am. Now look at Jesus standing here at the feast that day. They said, we know now you're crazy. Right words. You're mad. Mad is crazy. We know you're crazy. You're Samaritan. you got a devil. St. John, the sixth chapter. And he said, now you say that you're seen Abraham and you're a man not over 50 years old. He might have looked a little old for his age, but he's only 30, but his work. He said, you mean that you're a man not over 50 years old and say you've seen Abraham? We know you're crazy now. See? You said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> I am. He was the great I am. Here he is telling these Jews again. See? I am. And when you see me coming at the right hand of the power. Is that right? I'll read that again, brother. When you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Read yours now, Sister Woods. Yes, ma'am. All right, read your sister. See, it's just the same. I see. God couldn't have a big right hand. See? And Jesus standing on His right hand. The right hand means the authority. See? Just for instance, if, one of, if I was a full sway of the church, I was a bishop of some sort. And Brother Neville took my place to be my right hand. See, that means that he's, he would be at my right hand. Now, Jesus is at the right hand of the power. Now, he says so here in Ephesians when he's explaining. He's at the right hand of the power. All the powers of the heavens and earth, he said, after his resurrection, is given unto my hands. I have all the power in heavens and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations. Baptize them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things which I have commanded you, Lord, I'm with you always in the world. All the power in heavens and earth. Where is that? If there's a God up there besides him, he's powerless. See? There could be no other God. All the powers in the heavens and earth lays in his hand. So you see, he's standing on the right hand, as the person asked the question, doesn't mean, now look, the body, God is a spirit. How many understands that? Say amen. amen. God is the Spirit. Jesus is the man. And Jesus was God made flesh. Jesus was, we can never see God. See, He's a Spirit. You can't see Spirit. No man has seen God at any time. No man couldn't see God. And let me say this, you've never seen me. You've never seen me in all your life and you never will see me. Now, try it. You see this body that declares this person is in here. Now, this body doesn't have eternal life, but this spirit has eternal life. This body will go back, but it will come forth again in its likeness. Just like a grain of wheat goes into the ground. Uh, Christianity is based upon resurrection, not replacement. Resurrection. The same Jesus went in, the same Jesus come back. If you go down red-headed, you come back red-headed. If you go down black-headed, you come up black-headed. See, it's resurrection. When you go to Eton, I asked the doctor that not long ago. I said, why is it when I was 16 years old, every time I eat, I renew my life? I said, that's right. You take in new, new cells every time you eat the, the flesh, make, or the uh, food makes blood cells. And that blood cell makes you get stronger. That's how you live. Then something has to die every time... For you to live. Every day something died. If you eat meat, the cow died, or, the, or whatever you eat, and the fish died, or the, or the wheat died, that made the bread, the potato died, that made the potato. And the, every form of life, you can only live through dead substance. And you can only live eternally because something died. Jesus. Not because you joined church. Not because you were baptized. Not because you professed Christianity. But because you accepted 
the life of Jesus Christ, that was blood, blood that was shed for you, and you accept him as your personal Savior. Now, notice, I ask this. I want to ask you this. Look at this. It's beautiful. Maybe I've taught on it before. I don't know here. Preaching everywhere, you forget what you said at certain places. But why is it then? Now, I guess Sister Smith, I don't know whether I knew Brother Fleeman that far back or not. Trifina, I remember her when she was a little girl. You remember me. When I used to be, I was a little short, heavy set, black wavy hair. I used to box. Oh, I thought I was the stylish man in the world. <laughs> well, I thought there's nobody could whip me. No, sir. But I, I got fooled on that. <laughs> but I, I, I just thought, oh, my. I thought if you could put this thing on my back, I'd walk down the street with it. Sure. Nothing bothered me. And every time I eat, I got bigger and stronger. All the time. Every time I put new life in, I eat cabbage, potatoes, and beans, and meat just like I do today. And I got stronger and bigger all the time. And when I got to be about 25, <laughs> I eat better now than I did then. You all know me know that. <laughs> I can eat better now. All of us are. But why is it, Brother Egan, man, if I am still eating better food, more of it, better vitamins and everything. And the more I eat, I gradually dwindle away, and now I'm coming an old, stoop-shouldered man, bald-headed and turning gray, and hands rankling, face pinching, shoulders going down. Of a morning, it's hard to get up. And, oh, my. Why is it, if I renew my life every time I eat, why is it that... If I'm pouring water out of a jug into a glass and it gets half full and then starts going down all the time, instead of coming up, the more I pour it, the faster it goes down. There you are. And you couldn't prove it scientific if you had to. This book's the only thing to prove it. God has appointed. It's an appointment. God's seen us coming, you older men, you older women. Maybe some of your, your husbands and your wives may be gone on. That doesn't, that doesn't bother anything. Hallelujah. They're just across the curtain and are waiting. Absolutely. And they're longing to be with you again. Right. Certainly they are. They're longing to be together again. The Bible said they are the souls under the altar crying, Lord, how long? They're not in the right state. God never made us angels. He made us men and women. We'll always be men and women. Because we are a product of God's own intelligence. We can always be men and women. But what is it? See, maybe you think of when you walked out the altar, you and hubby, so that we take each other to be uh, lawful with wife and live together in the holy state of this matrimony and the graces of God and so forth, and all your testimony you give and your pledge you made. First thing you know, you know, both of you, you straighten it. Hair is shining, mom and her pretty little brown eyes or blue eyes or whatever it was. Oh, how you looked at her, you walked out. You looked at dad's house, straight them shoulders back, and after a while they begin to droop. Mama would get gray headed, arthritis set in, and so forth, and after a while, gone she went, or away he went. What was it? When God seen you standing there, he said, That's it. That's the way I want you. All right, death, you come on, but you can't take them, so I'll let you. Oh, I think of Job. <laughs> Amen. Yes. God was looking down. Job knew that God loved him. And notice, he cannot take you. He said, you've got it at your hands, but you don't take his life. And then the first thing you know, shoulders begin to stoop and act out. You were gone. What was that happened? Now, in the resurrection, there won't be one thing that symbols death. There can't be one thing that symbols this earth. Of what? See, you were coming up by the will of God. You had life. Then death said, in, take you down, eating the same food and everything, drinking the same kind of water. Everything. But death set in. But the picture's already set. Amen. Hallelujah. In the resurrection, you'll be life again. And there will be no death or no resemblance of death or old age or cripples or anything. Amen. Immortal will stand in his likeness, perfected forever. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, I doesn't make anybody shout. Praise God. Especially when you get my age. 
My age is, I guess, when you think of it more than ever. You're just that changing over type, you see. That you, you begin to wonder, what's it all about? What have I done? I look back down here and I think, my goodness, where, where's it gone to, Lord? Here I am, 48 years old. Two more years to be a half a hundred. Whew. I've only just looked at a few souls I've won. I want to win millions and millions of more. God help me. I get ashamed of myself even to come home on a vacation. I think, oh, the harvest is ripe and labors are few. Millions in sin and shame are dying every day. Listen to their call. I go to bed there at night and hear them poor little heathens are screaming yonder in the land. How they come by the thousands pulling at you men to stand out there at the airport when they had to have a militia out there to keep them back just to hear the story of Jesus Christ. And here we get begging and advertising the paper and everything else and get the very finest places for them to set down the best entertainment with fine singing. They'll come and, oh, I guess that was all right. <laughs> Don't belong to my faith, though. No, oh, my, how, how long can it last? It, ain't, it isn't right. And here we are raking off hundreds of billions of tons of food into the garbage can and then people would gladly receive it. And they're creatures of the earth the same as we are. Ah, we that can't act like that too long. All right. Now, who's the Father? The Father and the Son are one. What? In First John 5 and 7, it said, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is the Son, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, these three are one. There's three that bear a record in earth, which is water, blood, and spirit. That's the three elements that came from the body of Christ. They pierced his side. Water came out. Blood came out. Into thy hands I command my spirit. There you are. That's the three elements. These three are not one, but they agree in one. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 1 John 5, 7 says, These three are one. Water, blood, and spirit agree in one. Not one, but agree in one. So the Father, and the only thing that the body can do, when God can see His self, that through the punishment this body went through, there's the intersect, interception right there, see? There's when He sees that blood standing between Him and the judgment. Here's His Word said, The day you get there, the day you die. And here's Jesus said, I, But I took their place. See? I took their place. Remember my story the other night where I seen the vision of the woman real bad is in the room there? And I was condemned and said, God, why don't you blow the place up? Then he showed me, see? And I walked up to her and told her what had happened. Amen. Now, just last question. Do you think, according to the Scriptures, that the Jews will, be, will accept Christ just before the rapture of the church? I, I, I really believe at the rapture of the church, this is my own opinion, see? And if we had time, we'd take it through, but it's, it's after nine now. Look, I do believe that the Jews will receive Christ at His second coming. Now remember, so that the person would know this, our eyes were blinded, or their eyes were blinded, that we might receive our sight. Anyone knows the Scripture teaches that. Is that right? Paul tells us that, our, that we were blinded, that the Jews were blinded, in order that we might receive Christ. See? And we're the wild olive tree, which is drafted in by adoption into the tree. Now, here's my opinion. I'm just going to give you... They ask me, do you think? Now, here's where I think it'll take place. I don't know. Ever what it is, I'm sure that by God's grace and His mercy, we'll be there, see, uh, by His grace. Whatever it is, I may not be able to figure it out. But here's what I think. I believe we're at the end time. I believe the Gentiles' age is finishing right now. I believe we're at the close. And now the Jews... Here's been two things that's always wrong the Jews. They've been blind. They couldn't see it. And because that the Gentiles, for one thing, many times. I talked to a Jew at Benton Harbor, Sister Smith. And you know what he said to me? Over there, one of those Israel uh, places of Israel there, this question about a healing of a blind man. And he said, you can't cut Jews, and, uh, you can't cut God in three pieces and give him to a Jew. Make him Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Said you can't do that to a Jew. We're not idolaters. Said we believe in one God. Amen. See, and you go to making God three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. You certainly blind a Jew right there, because he knows better. He knows better than that. That'd make you an idolater just as certain as idolatry is. You got three gods. 
You've got to make them the self-same God. That's not three gods. It's three offices of the same God. See? God served in the fatherhood. He served in the sonship. And He serves now in the Holy Ghost dispensation. It's the same self-God. That's the reason that we was commissioned to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Because not in the name of... In the name. Not names. Not in the names or in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, but in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. See? Recognizing the self-same God being Christ. See? That's who it is. It can't be no other way, see? Yeah. And the Scripture... And, and then, if our revelation is wrong, then Peter and the rest of the apostles taught the wrong thing because every person in the Bible is baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Not one person is ever baptized in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's a Catholic doctrine. I prove it to you by their own words and their own lessons and everything. It's a Catholic creed and not a, not a Bible doctrine. And no man, even the King of England, was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ about 600 years after the death of the last apostle. When it was not even called England, it was called Angel Land. That's where it comes from the name. He was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What converted him was a little sparrow. When... Um, I can think not St. Angela. What was his name now? Uh, Agabus. St. Agabus? I believe it was. I won't be sure of that name now. But anyhow, he went up there. And they got some of these, and they called them angels because the people in the Assyrians and so forth were dark complected, and these English had long, white, curly hair, blonde headed, Anglo Saxon, you know, blue eyed. And they said they looked like angels, and so they called it Angel Land. And, uh, the servant of the Lord went up there and was preaching to the king, and they're sitting at a great open fireplace. I was reading a history of it not long ago. And a little bird flew into the light and went back out, and the king asked the question, where did he come from and where did he go? See? He came into the light, and we saw him, and he went back out in the darkness. Isn't that the way a man goes? He said, but what was he before he could come in here, said the preacher. See? That got the king. And the next morning, him and his household was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's right. The, uh, what, the first man that was ever sprinkled or ever baptized anyway in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost was in the Catholic Church. The first sprinkling ever took place was in the Catholic Church. The first pouring ever took place was in the Catholic Church. The Protestant Church always baptized in the Bible, the apostles, by immersing in the name of Jesus Christ. Everywhere, just... Find one place where there is anything else. See. Now, in this, this great time, the Jews cannot... I asked that rabbi, I said, Rabbi, would it be hard for you to believe the prophets? He said, I believe the prophets. I said, in Isaiah 9, 6, what did he mean unto us the son is born? Who was he speaking of? He said he was speaking of the Messiah. I said, then will the Messiah be born? Yes, he'd be born. I said, then if he's be born, he has to be, have a mother. Yes, he has to have a mother. And he has to have a father, too. He said, I said, absolutely. And would it be hard for you to believe that that wouldn't be a God, the great Jehovah who opened the Red Sea, could not give birth to this baby by immaculate birth? <laughs> there he was. He said, but you can't make him three gods. I said, he isn't three gods. I said, what relationship will Messiah be to God? He said, he will be God. I said, now you got it. Now you got it. He is God. That's exactly. Then he tried to tell me, he said, well, this man was a thief. This Jesus of Nazareth. He was a thief. I said, Rabbi, how was he a thief? Well, I said, your own scripture said that he went into the cornfield on the Sabbath day and took the corn. I said, now, Rabbi, you know better more about scriptures than that. Your own scripture says that's legal. It's lawful for a man to go and eat as much corn as he wants to, but don't put it in his sack and take it out. Your own law, the rabbi. And he stood there a little bit. He, he, he believed it because he, he witnessed. He said, after a while, he said, well, how, what, what caused John's eyes? So why did you do it? I said, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he didn't know. He said, well, you can't cut God in three pieces. I said, he was a Jehovah made manifest in flesh, rabbi. He, that's what he was. He was Jehovah in flesh. His own human name, that was a redemption name, because no other name is given under heaven that a man can be saved only through that human redemption name, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. He was God. He is God. He'll forever be God. That's exactly right. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that the Gentile church will soon 
the completing of the body of the Gentile church, the doors between... Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, I'll take that one scripture for a minute. He said, They will trod down the walls of Jerusalem until the Gentile dispensation be finished. Now watch. It was given by our Lord Jesus in Matthew 24 that the Jews would be taken out of the picture. Daniel said, back over in the old prophets, he said that there would be 70 of weeks yet lotted to the Jews. And the Messiah would come, the prince, and would prophesy in the midst of the 70 of weeks, which was uh, seven years, he would be cut off in the midst. Look how perfect it was. Jesus was exactly preached three and one half years and was crucified. But there is three, that come right in on this other question here, there is three and a half years yet lotted to them, to the Jews. It's got to be. Now, if you'll take Revelation, the seventh chapter, John saw 140 and 4,000 of the Jews all sealed. Of the twelve tribes of Israel. See what I mean? Yet previous to take place. Of the coming forth. Now, look how beautiful it is before we close now. Watch how, how it moves around. Now, those Jews have been darkened. Now, these Jews here, most of them here, are just, you know how they are. They are all the wealth of the world, and they're just... Just money people, and that's all you can make out of it, see? And very arrogant and indifferent and won't listen. But that's not the ones that he was talking about, if you'll notice. Now, the Gentiles, now what? There's yet left three and a half years for these Jews. Now, Jesus said that the city of Jerusalem will be trod by the Gentiles until the Gentile dispensation. Now, you people don't believe in dispensations. What about that? To the Gentile dispensation would be finished. And when the Gentile dispensation is finished, the time of the Gentiles is finished, then the city would be given back to the Jews. And Jesus went ahead to say that the generation said, when you go out and see the fig tree putting forth its buds and all the other trees budding, said, you know that summer's not. Said, likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know the time is nigh at the door. And verily I say unto you that this generation will not pass until these things be fulfilled. Now, they watch for it in that generation. That's what he was talking about. Not at all. Listen. He said, the generation has seen the fig tree putting forth its bud. Now, watch. He said, the fig tree and all the other trees. Now, in other words, there'll be a universal revival at the time. Now, watch this prophecy, how it works in and just blends in perfectly. Now what? All the other trees putting forth their buds, reviving. A tree, when it's putting forth its buds, is reviving. Is that right? Now, anyone knows, a prophetic teacher, that the fig tree has always been the Jew. We know that. It's a Jew. Now, the, and look at Joel when he took it over. He said, what the palm worm let the caterpillar eat, what the caterpillar let the locust eat, and what the locust eat. If you notice, that's the very same insect, different stages. The palm worm, the caterpillar, the locust, it's all the same bug. It's just different stages of its life. Now watch that same bug begin to eat on that Jewish tree back there, cut it down, and it begin to eat and eat and eat and eat to the cuck it to a stump. But then he said, I will restore, saith the Lord, all the years that the caterpillar eat up. And I'll make my people a joy. See? Now, the tree has been eaten down. The Gentiles have drafted into it. That's true. All right, we must bring fruit. Now, when the end time comes, when we're getting down to the end, if I see it right, the gospel is there's supposed to be a great revival taking place. Now, did you know that the Jewish flag is the oldest flag in the world? And it's been laying dormant for 2,000 years, more than, yeah, about 2,500 years. The Jewish flag, that six-point star of David, never flowed for 2,500 years since the carrying away of, of Babylon. And now, because the Roman Empire took them over and the Messiah come and they rejected and they scattered to the four winds of the earth. But did you know on May the 6th, 1946, that flag come back over Jerusalem again? Did you know on May the 7th, 1946, the angel of the Lord appeared to me the next day up here and sent me to all the world to bring forth a revival? The very next morning? When that flag raised in Jerusalem... As it going down to the sun that afternoon, the angel of the Lord appeared here in the United States at the same time. Amen. When you see the fig tree and the rest of the trees putting forth. How many remembers a star hanging down here at the Ohio River? 
many years ago when he said, here's the picture of it here yet when he come down. He said, your message will go forth as a forerunner for the second coming just like John went forth as a forerunner for the first coming. And look, around the world has swept a revival. Tens of thousands times thousands and thousands. And a great revival. All the legalists and all the different ones around over the country in the big churches said that the Billy Sunday days are over. But when they seen the church begin to revive the common people, they had to save their face. Amen. Charles Fuller would have took the place, but he's too old. So they went with Billy Graham. And God took Billy Graham with the Baptist church did. And they all got around him. And Billy Graham's not half the preacher that Brother Neville is so far as a preacher. Not a, no, by no means. But what is it? They had to do it. It's organism and everybody right around and together around. Billy says the same thing. See? They had to do it. And it had to be done to fulfill the Word of God. They didn't have the Spirit to rally around, so they had to take the Word to rally around. So they did it. Billy's a Word preacher and a dandy. And they rallied around, so that put all the coal farmers in their rally. And the supernatural being with divine healing and powers and workings and so forth of the miracles of God put the, the church, the raptured bride that's got the oil in her lamp, put her in a revival. See? And the formal church had its revival. And here's Israel turning with their revival. Amen. I've got a film up there in my house right now. Three minutes till midnight. And we've got a picture of those Jews coming in. Coming in, you've seen it in Look Magazine. And there's ships loaded, coming from way down in Iran. And down there, them Jews never did even know that Jesus is ever on the earth. They went down there and they're carrying away a Babylon. That's all they ever know. They plowed, you see seen it in Look Magazine, their life and then, where they plowed with old wooden instruments. And when they seen those airplanes coming in, they thought, this is it. Because God told them they'd be down there and would be carried back to Jerusalem on the wings of eagles. Amen. That's right. There you are. And the Jews said, this is it. They stepped right on him. We got their pictures with their own voice and interviewed them, coming from all over the world. Some of them packing their old ones on their back and then blind and crippled. And they're getting off the ships from all different parts of the world coming in. And they begin to pick up rocks and sacks off the ground, and today they found fountains of water. Amen. She's the most greatest agricultural country in the world. Amen. The Dead Sea holds more riches than all the rest of the world put together. Amen. The Jews are returning back. It's been hid from the Gentiles, but they're blossoming like a rose. Amen. They said to them, Jews, they said, are you coming back to die in the homeland? They said, we are coming back to see the Messiah. Amen. Where's the at? He's supposed to be here. Brother, when you see the fig tree putting forth its bud, Amen. he said, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. Look at the revival with the farmers. Look at the revival with the church. Look at the revival coming into the Jews. They're watching for the coming of the Messiah. The church, the spirit-filled church, the bride with the, the uh, virgins with the oil in her lamp will go into the wedding supper. The Jews will say, this is that. <laughs> There's our God who we waited on. There's where 144,000 that Russellites got mixed up in. There's those Jews standing there that will receive him. They say, there's our God who we waited on. They'll see you say, where did you get them? Where did you get them scars in your hand? He said, I got them in the house of my friends. Amen. That's right. The house of my friends. What will he do? The Gentile church will be taken into glory and the bride will be married to Christ. Amen. How did Joseph make himself known to his people? He dismissed every Gentile from his presence. He certainly did. What will happen to the rim of the woman's seed? The dragon spurted water out of his mouth to make war. Jesus said they'll be cast into outer darkness and there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The great hours of persecutions and trials will come to the Gentile church. What will take place then? When the martyrdom comes, when God has separated everything from them Jews on earth, Jesus will return. As Joseph did when they heard Joseph, when he dismissed all of his guards and everything else, and he seen little Benjamin and them standing there and them repenting for killing Joseph, they thought they'd kill Joseph. And here he was standing before him. He said, I'm Joseph. I'm your brother. Amen. 
Then they really trembled. Amen. He's Joseph. Now we know him when he'll say, I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. They'll say, oh my, now what we'll receive, it was all done for the glory of God. It won't be easy. Well, they can hear him weeping from over in Pharaoh's palace. Joseph weeping for him. Wait till Jesus sees those Jews that he had to smite blind to let us Gentiles have a chance to come in. That'll be an hour, I'm telling you. He'll take those Jews. Don't you never worry. Them Jews will be saved. Yes, sir, there's got to be there. And that's my idea of it. I can't sit nowhere else in the Scripture. You've got to keep them three together again. You've got to keep the, the sleeping virgin, the, the church, just normal, confessional. See? You've got to get the church. That's the Jew first. The Jew first, which is just a blinded person waiting on the sideline. You've got to get the next step up which is a sleeping virgin who was dilatory and just went out and went to church and joined the church and pretty good fellow. Then you got to get the church spiritual, the rapture, the bride. There she stands, those three people. You can't, they're not mixed up. Not a bit, they're not all the same. Not Jehovah Witness saying that 144,000 is the bride. That's wrong. That's the Jews. See, there's a bride, the Jews, and the sleeping virgin. And you get them all and say, well, they're all three in different places. They're all three different classes of people. Amen. Sure they can then when Jesus returns to the earth, the Jews, what are they? The eunuchs of the temple. And when Jesus returns, he comes with the bride. Jesus comes three times. He comes the first time to redeem his church. He comes the second time to receive his church. He comes the third time with his church. Amen. Okay? Exactly. So it's all one great perfect coming. It's all one great perfect God. It's all one great perfect Christ. One great perfect church. One great perfect redemption. Everything. It comes in Trinity, but it's all in one. See? Amen. It's not three people, not three this. It's just one person, one church, one body, one Christ, one Lord in you all, through you all, and so forth like that. All one. Amen. The Lord bless you. I've helped you pretty long. The Lord being willing now, if I get to come again... On a few nights or Sunday night or something like that, if the pastor here doesn't have something on his heart, I'll try to answer these here. Oh, there's some dandies here. How many like to hear them? Amen. Oh, I just love them. Amen. Let me go through them again right real quick before we turn to service to the pastor. Just listen to this. Where do the stones... What does the stones represent in Revelation 21? That's a good one. Explain the four beasts of Revelation 5. There's another good one. Who are the 24 elders? There's another good one. See? What did the scarlet thread of Genesis 38 mean? You remember, you went and took his own uh, daughter-in-law and lived with her as a harlot and made the price and come forth and then the child come forth and put the scarlet thread around his hand. He pushed out and then he come back in the ex next and come before him. Oh, that's a good one. Yes, sir, is. What are the gifts to be sent regarding the death of the witnesses of Revelation 11? That's when Moses Elijah returns back for the Revival to these 144,000. What is the gifts? Watch what them are. That's dandy. Where will the saints be after the 1,000 years? There's a good one, boy. What, rain, what kind of a body will they have? How shall we judge angels? Why hair becomes of the angels in First Corinthians and the book of First Corinthians? It's a good one. Really good. The Lord bless you. I hope the Lord permits us to get together and discuss these things. It's all for His glory. Amen. We might disagree upon the ideas of them, but I'll say one thing. If you all get as much joy hearing them as I do talking about them, we're having a wonderful time. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. The Lord be real good to you now. Don't forget the services. Brother Neville's broadcast now. That's on WLRP Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. The Neville Quartet. And I'm sure they do you good. Turn in and listen to them. And if I can, if I get back in time or see them go to get back, I'll call wife. If the Lord permits me, go see dear old Brother Bosworth. Uh, uh, and I'll be back Sunday night. The Lord be good to you now. And Brother Pastor, come here just a minute. And let him take the service. And don't forget the family prayer. Jesus wants to meet you there. He will take your every care. Oh, don't forget the family prayer. You like that? How many prays in your own home? Let's see. All in all. That's Stay close to God. Be good, little children. God will bless you. All right.